So good uh, morning, good afternoon to uh, good night maybe to um, to all of you uh, today and uh, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, so my name is Jan Hamers and I'm uh, pretty honored to uh, host this uh, uh, um, this webinar, which is part of a series we're given here on different examples of uh, applying thermal desorption. Um, Today's uh, host of the webinar is uh, Lea de Koenig, and uh, she's a mechatronic engineer who works for Hamers Technologies as a project engineer. She's been involved um, in, in quite uh, a lot of in situ thermal desorption projects all over, and she chose today to talk about a specific case which uh, goes on uh, actually or currently in uh, the center of Brussels under an existing building. Uh, I'm not going to spoil too much, but it's going to be also she's on site right now and uh, we will enjoy a live visit of the site as well. So that's as a brief introduction for Lea. Uh, a couple of points of uh, just organization and points of order. Uh, the first thing is that if you have questions, I'd like you to use the chat box uh, either to all or directly uh, to the to the hosts, uh, and uh, we'll gather all the questions at the end of the presentation and we'll go over them. So that makes a smooth uh, webinar. Uh, the webinar is recorded, so for those of you who uh, have to leave or who want to share it uh, later on, there is no uh, no problem. Just uh, be aware that it will be available and sent to uh, to you uh, after the meeting. But uh, enough said of that. Um, so my pleasure is to introduce Leah, who's uh, uh, awaiting and uh, who will share that uh, pretty interesting project uh, with all of us uh, this morning. Uh, Leah, the floor is yours. So hello, everyone. And uh, so Jan said that um, today on this webinar, we will talk about thermal desorption under a building. And as example, we will use a specific site we treat in Echo. And uh, first of all, we will uh, begin with a small presentation of the company. Then we will start with our main subject, the thermal desorption. We will also talk about the steps of a project. And we will close this webinar with a small visit and uh, your questions. Hammers Technology is a Belgium company specified in uh, soil remediation by thermal desorption for over than 25 years. Hammers Technology devotes a large part of its resource to uh, research and development in order to be able to offer solutions for its projects and to constantly improve his technology. Our office and uh, laboratories are located in Brussels, but our technology has been provided all over the world. We already have worked uh, all over Europe, in Singapore, in Vietnam, in Canada, and uh, much more other countries. We have done uh, different remediation projects, some uh, in-situ remediation, some ex-situ remediation, but the kind uh, that will interest us today is, of course, the thermal disruption under a building. Everything begins with uh, a client who is looking to sell uh, the administrative building of the municipality of Uckel. And to do this, he needs to remediate the basement under the office. Indeed, uh, they find the hydrocarbon pollution up to four meters below the ground level due to the leak of an oil tank. And the polluted area has a surface of 160 square meters. This covers most of the underground surface. And the deadlines were quite tight because the building has to be sold within the year. Uh, the site is located in the middle of an urban area. So it implies noise and other restrictions for the habitants in the streets. And the office will not be occupied during the works, but some reunions are still going on the site during the treatment. And a daycare is in operation in the neighboring building.
So to be more uh, precise, in this case, the site contained two talk tanks of fuel oil of each 5,000 liter, and uh, these tanks leaked over several years. This is unfortunately a situation that happens uh, regularly. And in order to sell the building, the owner must go under the concentration of 870 milligram of hydrocarbon for a kilogram of uh, dry soil. And the current concentration are more than 8,500 milligrams, and there are a maximal concentration on some points that more than 30,000 uh, milligrams. Another important point on this site is the access that is also quite uh, restricted. We are talking about an entrance door of more than two meter high and one meter half high in the middle of an urban area in Brussels, which restricted um, the choice of remediation technique without destroying the building. I try to use, okay, see, so see we see the door and the yard. We can see here some pictures of the basement. There is a main room with a ceiling uh, of about five meter high containing uh, a boiler that must be preserved, you can see here. And we have three uh, little rooms with a ceiling of about two meter ten high. With all these informations, uh, the consultant must propose a remediation solution that meets uh, all these constraints. And the only existing solution proposed by the consultant, leaving the site in the same state as uh, before on these pictures, is the thermal desorption. And Hammers Technology can propose a solution that is already implemented in many projects, the Institute Thermal Desorption under a building using his smart uh, burners. So how does uh, thermal desorption works? For the first step, we put uh, heating pipes in the soil at regular points, and by heating up the soil by conduction, the thermal the temperature of the soil will goes up and soil once the soil has reached the proper temperature the contaminants in the soil will be transformed into vapor phase the smart burners who heated the soil created by hammers technology are fueled by a diesel natural gas propane or other fuels and this burner will produce a flame so that the hot air circulates circulate in his inner tube to the bottom of the tube and then we go back throughout the other tube comes here and then it go back to the outside so uh, there is no uh, direct contact between the heated air and the soil the, te the temperature of these tubes placed in the contaminated soil can rise to 500 degrees and will heat the soil by conduction the second step, the second step of um, the thermal desorption consists of recovering the volatile pollutants. Once the contaminants are vaporized, it will be sucked by another pipe, this one, the vapor tube, which is put under negative pressure and will suck all the contaminated vapors of the soil. And finally, to uh, recover the Finally, the recovered vapors are treated and they can either be sent to a vapor treatment unit where they are condensed, burned, or absorbed on activated carbon and are reinjected directly into the flame in the case of a hydrocarbon pollution. And this process is called reburn, but we will talk about it um, just later. 
So now talk about what's happened to the soil when it's heated. There are three main stages in the temperature rise of the soil. The first stage is a temperature increase from the initial temperature from the soil to 100 degrees. On this stage, the temperature profile shows a plateau because this is because all the energy that we injected in the soil is used to um, evaporate the water. It is only when all the water has been evaporated that a temperature rise can be observed and that we can temperature targets. This target is often between 350 degrees and 350 degrees, depending on the contaminant. And when the tem target temperature has been reached, we can shut down our installation. An important question is what kind of contaminant can we treat by our technology? Simply all the pollutants that can be thermally dissolved at a temperature up to above 350 degrees. This includes all the organic pollutants such as hydrocarbons, chlorinated solvents, but also uh, inorganic pollutants. So we can retain that all pollutants can be treated by thermal desorption except for heavy metals. And we have one exception uh, in this exception is the mercury that we also can treat. If the contaminants in question are hydrocarbons, we will apply what we call the reburn. The reburn process uh, consists of directing the vapors sucked from the soil and to directly re-inject them into the burner combustion chamber. The polluted vapors are so directly burned in the chamber and the contaminants are destroyed. The advantage of this process is that the vapors can be treated while reducing the energy consumption of the burner and by reusing the energy properties of the hydrocarbons initially present in the soil. In the case of a heavier pollution or for a very high concentration of hydrocarbons, the contaminated vapors are sent to a vapor treatment unit. The vapor treatment unit consists of a series of elements that participate uh, to the condensation, incineration, or the adsorption of the pollutants. And the type of vapor treatment units depends on the type of uh, pollutants. What are the benefits of this solution? Um, our, our technology is adaptable to any size of sites. In fact, we just have to multiply the smart burners to heat the whole area. It is easy to apply the technology inside or around the buildings. We just must be able to drill the boreholes. Uh, it is easily installed and does not require any excavation and all the inco inconvenience that excavation implies, such as uh, mobilization of trucks and all the logistics. It is a fast treatment. We are talking about a few weeks of heating. And it is a solution that does not cause noise pollution or any smells. Indeed, people still live in the street at this moment without being disturbed by noise or smells that determine the daily life. And this is at any time of the project. And the nursery just next door continues to play in the yard of the building. When we walk in the street, we can barely notice that remediation works are taking place in the basement. And finally, the most important, we treat the pollution and we are not moving it uh, to another site. So in, how will we apply this technology to uh, the remediation projects in Uckel? So as a reminder, we have pollution due to the leakage of a fuel uh, oil, ta oil tank. Since the pollution is hydrocarbon, we will be able to apply the reburn and we avoid the installation of a vapor treatment unit. The treatment area has a surface of 160 square meters, so we will drill 42 wells 
of fear and a four and a half meter. And we will place a 42 burner to ensure a homo homogeneous heating all over the polluted area. The target temperature for the hydrocarbon is 220 degrees because they will pass in vapor phase at this temperature. And we are talking about um, a 50 day heating process. This is what the eco remediation site looks like uh, today. So we can recognize the main room here. That's transformed. We can recognize uh, the corridor. And the uh, two little rooms. In yellow, uh, we can see the gas network. Uh, we can see our smart burners, uh, the burner's body. We can see the network, uh, which search the combustion gas and send them directly to the chimney. And we can see the chimney uh, in the yard of the building where the post combustion gases are discharged. So we will now take some time to see uh, all the steps of a remediation project. Once the project is uh, launched, the remediation can be done quite quickly. We are talking about a project that will be completed in a few months. First of all, we will begin with the engineering phase. This step can take some time because it depends on the suppliers. And we have to define, define all the drilling points for the heating system uh, while avoiding the building foundation. And we have to define how to install the extraction of the combustion gas here and the external chimney. We have to ensure a continuous supply of gas, uh, of electricity to all the burners. When this is done, we will begin with the most restrictive element of our technology, the drilling. For this project, it was necessary to find a drilling machine uh, capable of uh, drilling up to four and a half meter, able to pass the door, and able to drill in a room of a two meter high. How much technology possess this machine? And it took us about two weeks to complete the 42 uh, boreholes. Once the hole have been drilled, the heating pipes can be placed inside by welding the pieces together. It is in fact not possible to put directly a four meter tube into the soil due to the restricted space in the room. That's explained the need of a welding. And then simply uh, we will add the inner tube and place the burner on the top. This step is done simultaneous, simultaneously with the drilling. Once all the burner are installed, it will take us about two weeks to install the networks. We will install the electrical network, the gas network, and the vapor networks that run from the combustion chamber to the chimney. Once the treatment is start, it should be heated for about five weeks. Hamas Technology will supervise uh, the work daily. A remote monitoring system provides the temperature of each burner and uh, the temperature of the soil. It is still necessary to come uh, every day to take measurements at the chimney, uh, to take the pressure in the soil, to be sure that the vapors are being sucked out and uh, to simply check daily that the site is working uh, properly. A report can also be provided to the client on a daily basis for uh, accurate site uh, monitoring. At these days, in Uckel, we have reached the plateau everywhere of the plateau of 100 degrees, and some points have already reached 
uh, more than 200 degrees. Once the target temperature has been reached, we will take uh, hot samplings to check the state of the depollution. A sample is taken in the critical areas and if the sample meets the target we fixed with the partner in the beginning of the project, then we will shut down our installation. So, uh, in fact, I am in this remediation site during this presentation and I can propose you to come with me in the basement to make a small visit in life of the remediation site. Okay, so now you, you're, uh, Lea, you're going downstairs, as we can all see. Um, we'll give you some time to, we'll follow you. And uh, well, it it's well we follow you. Let's let's put it this way. Um, so the office is on the on the base floor, uh, at the street level. So here we can see uh, they are going uh, towards the stairs, going down uh, in I mean towards the treatment area. The yellow. Uh, pipe you see is just to take the hot air uh, out and to make uh, the temperature on the site uh, acceptable and livable. So here we are. Here we are in the different small rooms in the basement where you can see the action. Uh, yeah? Over yes, so here we are in the basement of the old administrative building of uh, Uckel. We can see here our smart burners. We can see the burner chamber where there is the flame um, who makes the heat that go down to the formatter in the outer tube and then goes up with uh, the outer tube to the formatters. We can see here our vapor tube. So this vapor tube sucks all the vapors in the ground and they are directly re-injected in the combustion chamber to burn all the contaminants and the combustion gases are sucked in the vapor um, network and directly re-injected to the chimney who's outside. Uh, this burner is now at 450 degrees, so it's quite hot and it's uh, heating the soil. So we put thermocouples uh, at what we call the cold points. The cold points are the points who are the furthest of all the burners. So we can check when this point is at 220 degrees at four meters. We know that the all area, the all polluted area is heat enough, is, is hot enough to begin with a hot sampling and then to shut down our system. Uh, we can also see here a pressure tube where we can check that the um, soil is always in depression. We can see the gas supply, the electrical network, and um, and so it is. There are some uh, alarms to be sure that there are no leak of gas, of, of uh, CO. There are some cameras, so we can daily check what's happened here. And you can see uh, with me, if you come, the one of the two small rooms. And all our installation. So that's it. I will uh, go back upside for the questions. If it's okay. Well, thank you very much. I think it's, it, it, it's interesting what you could see also uh indeed it's uh it, it's that there is uh, a lot of equipment you could i think everyone could see how close uh, burners are from each other uh but also that indeed there is um it's not you know i mean you can't smell things from here but at least you could clearly see that people work in normal conditions in this area and uh and it's it's not noisy we can uh, i was pretty 
pleased to, to see that we could do this webinar from uh, from the basement and that everybody could hear clearly what was going on. So um, I was just to, so as a, as a matter of practical, if you have questions, don't hesitate to put them in the chat. If you if you want to know a little bit more, I will wait for Leah to get back to uh, the office so that she can uh, take on the first questions. But uh, thank you. I'd like to to thank her for the effort and uh, and doing it on a let's say on a live stream in the in in uh, on, on the site. I think it's it, it's pretty nice. Thank you very much, uh, Leah. So here you're back. See a first question about um, any idea of the cost of the of the whole treatment. Uh, yes, this treatment uh, in Ukraine costs uh, three hundred thousand uh, euro for all the works we have done. From the begin the beginning to the end of the project, we have done everything, and we will uh, give the site back how it was in the beginning. Okay, so that's about that's about two hundred and fifty euro per ton, all included. Which which uh, compares to essentially not not excavation, I guess, because that was not an option. No excavation was not an option because. You have to destroy the building and then he's in a good state. So it, that was not an option. All right, so don't um, again I, uh, just put your questions. Uh, I have another one. What was the, the type of fuel of uh, combustible you used? Uh, here is uh, natural gas that is used. And in this kind of project, it's the best because uh, it makes less uh, CO and we can better control what uh, what's happening and it's easy to find natural gas in a in a building in a town because um, the city can provide natural gas because essentially the if i understand that the heater that was leaking was this, when the the, the 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 heater for the building was working on heat on diesel or on a, let's say yes. a liquid and now it's converted to natural gas so that's where you plugged it in Exactly. We plugged our installation on the natural gas of the of the building. Okay. Um, could it be done uh, in uh, under existing houses from the outside? Uh, yes, we already have some project where we put the tubes um, obliquely, obliquely inclined inclined under the building, so we don't have to to bore into the building, but that has to be a, a reflection and engineering steps. But I have some picture on the slide if you if it is easy to show. No. No, it will not work. So and, and in total from the, the moment you got there until the moment you got out, how long did the project take? When you, I, I understand it's almost finished now, but uh, we uh, we have begun the engineering phase in f um, February March, and we have start up the installation in Jul July, end of July, and now uh, in two weeks it will be the heating will be finished, and we will begin to to uh, take back all our stuff. Okay. So a question about could this system be applied to PFAS? Yeah, maybe I can uh, I can take that one um, because it, it I mean the the answer on the on the PFAS is the system as such is is uh, not applicable to PFAS. The, but PFAS can be treated, and we've done I mean not not only ourselves but a, a couple more have applied. Uh, the thermal to demonstrate that PFAS could be treated. The difference, the, the, the nuance I want to bring is thermal, conductive thermal will heat the soil so that um, so that the PFAS would be vaporized and extracted, but we would not reburn them. We would need to go to a specific uh, unit, typically with a thermal oxidizer to destroy the PFAS. Very similar to the one to what we did for uh, Agent Orange and Dioxin, for which we held a seminar 
couple of uh, weeks or months ago and, and which is also available if you want to know more. So the the let's say the the way we applied it for dioxins is very close to the way we apply it for PFAS, which is a little bit different than this one. Uh, this one is more, I'd say, elegant in the sense that there is no vapor treatment unit because we use the contaminant as fuel, uh, but for PFAS we would not do that. Um, then there is another question about the type of permit that we needed uh, in order to get that and uh, from the competent authorities. Um, I don't. We don't need a specific uh, auto, um, permit because we. Um, what we. Uh, on the chimney, that everything is out uh, under the. Um, the legal. Um, how do we call it? The targets, so we can. Put our chimney in the the yard without any permit. And um, we just have permits for the gas and the electricity that they can come to open the um, the supply. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 help you out here. The to answer the the question about permit, the the legal framework in in the Brussels region, which is but the same in many many other regions around us, is that there is an obligation to clean up. So the customer, in this case, it was by the way the municipality had an obligation to clean up. The obligation to clean up was in order for them to be able to sell the site. And so there was a contamination. It was not representing a risk, but for anyone who wanted to purchase it, it would then trigger a form of an obligation to remediate. The choice has been made to remediate to remediate completely, so to eliminate the, 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 the pollution instead of managing the pollution. That's the choice that the, the city in this case made. And then there is the regional authority, which then delivers the obligation to remediate, to remediate together with the permit to do so. So an external consultant, which is uh, who is who is uh, designing and supervising this and following this and reporting to the authority, they have submitted a remediation plan. That plan has been approved by the authorities, and that approval by the authorities is the permit. So that that uh, is uh, and, and that includes uh, all the the work we're doing there, the air release eventually, uh, but there is not more uh, in this case on on release. So that's the permit validity, if you will. We don't need any external permit other than the remediation permit, and the control of that is done by uh, an external um, consultant who works. I mean, essentially under the the the. the um, uh, the control of the regional authorities, and by the way, the regional authorities they also come on site and and visit it on a, on a regular on a regular basis. Um, the CO2 cost of the system per ton treated. Uh, I think we can. Uh, I don't know if you have that. I I, I know the number in total. Um, I don't know if you have that, Maria, with you. I know I don't have it. But the total consumption of natural gas for this project will finish at 35,000 cubic meters for 1,800 tons. Um, so we we did so to give you an idea on on the CO2 cost. Um, there has been a study not on this project but very on exactly the same thing for underground storage tank uh, in a residential area. The com the the break even with CO2 emission was excavating and driving 80 kilometers. So if you excavate the soil, you drive 80 kilometers, then you drive back with clean soil and you put it back in, you will have the same CO2 impact or the same energy consumption as treating it with this technology in situ. The difference though is that with the uh, excavation, dig and dump solution, it's still contaminated soil. It hasn't been treated. You just, uh, you have just moved it. So uh, that's bottom line. Uh, the consumption um, from top of my head, uh, we're in the range of 50 kilowatt hours per ton in this in this case uh, on total consumption. So you can you can convert it with natural gas, how much CO2 that is. But it's it's a, it's a very, very important point. We're working on that a lot in, in the company to make sure that uh, we keep that edge to be one of the least energy consumption technologies, although people, you know, 
naturally think, oh, yo, you, you, you're burning gas, so you're going to use a lot of consumption. We actually use way less than if you excavate and move it. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind, in particular for consultants who compare technologies to compare apples and apples, and then to really look at what's the total uh, impact of it. And that's being set aside. We're talking about sustainability, and I, 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 I love the subject. When you talk about sustainability, it's what the benefit of it is. And with regard to sustainability, any in situ solution should be preferred over dig and dump in any case. And in this case, if you could do it without disturbing it, as Leah showed, I was there, I was on site yesterday. You could see the kids just running and playing and, run, and, and running their bikes. It, the, the nuisance or the disturbance to the, to the community and the neighborhood is really. I mean, as low as it is imaginable. So that's also a very, very huge benefit uh, to it and, and, and makes this technology very sustainable. Uh, and, you know, last but not least, comparing to dig and dump, you don't shove the burden to the next generation. You, you, you really handle it, you treat it, it's over, and the next generation doesn't have to care about it. If you transfer it somewhere else, it's just to say, okay, fine, <laughs> we'll, we'll, someone else will deal with it. So. Um, but it's a pretty good question. Um, I see there are no more no no more questions or uh, one last one eventually one. I think if it's uh, that will um, I will uh, call it off then for them. I'd, I'd really my warmest thank to uh, Leah and a uh, great effort. Uh, it's really a nice presentation, very clear, and I really appreciated the fact that we could get. Uh, down in the basement and, and see and hear uh, what was going on. I'd like to thank all the participants of this uh, webinar. Um, those who require certificates for credit, uh, don't hesitate to uh, ask it uh, for training credits. We'll provide you that. And um, again, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's recorded. So if you need the recording, you'll uh, you'll get it. Uh, don't uh, don't worry and, uh, you know, stay tuned. There are many more to come and uh, thanks a lot for all of you. Good day, good night, good evening, whatever from all over the world. Thanks a lot and uh, see you next time. And again, thank you very much, Leah.